today. I would like to talk about the guru. Um, I'm sure most of you can, you know why. I'm sure a lot of you have read an article on the internet about gurus. And, um, and I just feel like it's the topic and I would like to talk about it. So, did I have a guru? Well, I wouldn't call it a guru because I, if you're sure if you followed me, I'm really anti using Indian words in um, like bringing Indian words over, like we've got European English words to use. And I just personally don't really like using those words. Um, I think it's better that we find our own words to depict it, depict spirituality with. Um, so I wouldn't say that I had a guru because I don't like that word. But I would say that I had a teacher. But so I had a teacher that I lived with. For three years and it was in the typical tradition of the guru that what the guru said was right and that I was always cleaning my mind like I, I had to be shown that everything I thought wasn't true so what happened to me over those three years of living with the, the teacher was I was shown that everything I thought wasn't true and that was really super painful because it was like it made you cr it was crazy making in a way because your mind has this momentum to believe something and it wants to believe something and then somebody tells you it's not true and it can bring up all types of feelings and emotions and dislike for that person so the process is like surrendering more and more to that teacher because at first you'll fight the teacher you're not really n aware of it but you fight it and the teacher that i was living with he wasn't famous at the time so i'd been told by ramesh balsaka to listen to him and and my mind fought a lot and then the teacher just depicted it so every time I fought that gave me the opposite answer and it got me to the stage where I couldn't tell what was true which is really vulnerable place to be at and a really um, open place to be at to to see that everything you think and feel isn't necessarily the truth and it was really amazing it was really beautiful it was super hard and painful and vulnerable um, and it broke me. It was like breaking in a horse. It broke me in a way because I couldn't, um, I couldn't win ever. I always lost. I always gave up and said, I don't know. Anything that my mind presented as an argument, the teacher presented an opposite argument. And then I was like, this is bad. Oh, oh I don't know. And, um, and that went on for three years. And then I left the teacher and after I left the teacher, I had a big awakening. I'd had many big awakenings in that three years. And prior to meeting um, the teacher, like prior to meeting them, um, I had lots of awakenings as well. So I was like really ripe when I met him. And this is a really controversial subject in spirituality now because I mean, basically, when you have a teacher, the idea of it, particularly the Indian tradition is, is that you give up everything and you completely surrender to the teacher and everything the teacher says is right, even if the teacher hits you in the face, which um, I remember reading an article about a Tibetan teacher doing that to a student on stage. He just hit this female teacher in the face. I mean, it's not it's not a subject for the the <laughs> for the um, mass, shall we say. But this is very traditional, not hitting the student in the face. But having a guru in Asian countries and in Hinduism and in Buddhism, it's often the case and it's come over to the West now. And in the West, it's so controversial. Like in the West, it's um, everybody, the, the mentality is about being politically correct and equ um, equality and moving away from dictatorship and the guru is like um total dictatorship you give up everything to the guru 
I mean, traditionally you gave your money, you gave your property. I had no money or property to give, so they didn't get anything out of me. <laughs> um, so that that's the traditional way. And, you know, a lot of people that get into non-duality or get into spirituality, they kind of gloss over that bit and they look at talks on the internet and they just forget about that. I mean, a lot of people that listen to me are, say, fans of like Ramana, uh, Ramana Maharshi and like he was a guru he was of that tradition where you'd go to him and you had to completely surrender to him and surrender to his will and surrender to what he says he was of that tradition um, but people tend to gloss over that and think that spirituality has moved on and is different I don't know I mean I I you know, before my awakening, I got to the place where it was like, I don't know. And after my awakening, I still am, I don't know. You know, w with the teacher, you question whether the teacher is like a narcissist or a psychopath. And then you think they're a gift from God and you think they're amazing. And that's what happens when you're waking up is that you think they're the devil and then you think they're heaven. And you think what they say is right, and then when you think what they say is wrong, because that's the nature of the mind to swing from opposite polarities. And then sometimes you just have a view of them of somewhere in the middle. And still to this day, I don't know. I always say, you know, I don't even you um I don't even know if my teacher was enlightened or not. Um and and they even say traditionally in texts it doesn't matter if the teacher is enlightened or not, if the, if the student fully surrenders to that process, then it doesn't matter if they're a narcissist, a psychopath, or if they're um, free. Um, and I don't know if you'd ever be able to tell the difference if somebody's enlightened or if somebody isn't, because what is enlightened behavior and what isn't enlightened behavior? And so this might be scaring a lot of people that I went through this process. I never talk about it, and it's not in my nature to promote that. I don't promote that relationship with people that come. Um, I don't know if it's right or wrong, or if it's a good or bad thing. I know that it happened here, and that after he kicked me out, he says, he says that, um, like, you know, there's that famous saying, when the student's ready, the teacher kicks them out. So he says that's the way it was. And still... I don't know. Um, I, I have so much gratitude and respect for what happened between us, and I really love him. But I don't know what led to the change that happened here. How could I ever possibly know that? Um, it happened, and or there is the story of it, and that's the way it goes. Um, what I do know is that there was a surrendering of this mind. The mind couldn't find truth. The mind couldn't find reality. And, you know, when you get to that place, there's such an openness that comes about. There's such a vulnerability that comes about. But then after that happened, after that big awakening happened, it's almost like from a baby I had to learn again how to be with humans because I was so open I, um, to not knowing what was good or bad or right or wrong. So when you're that open, um, then I had to go through a process of learning to be human again because then I attracted people that wanted things from me and I didn't have the correct barriers up anymore because it was like being born again. It was like a child naively going out in the world and believing that everybody's pooping rainbows and um, and talking about love. and And also I kind of saw everyone as enlightened I still do, but there's like it's almost like I had to, on the human level, become more savvy. Um, but I remember just I just I still do see everybody as enlightened. That's maybe why I don't promote the student teacher thing. Like I always presume that they know what I'm talking about and that they see the way I see it. And I think that's another reason why at first I used to talk really like. Um, what you call the absolute teaching, because I assumed that everyone had sort of seen that their mind isn't true, seen that that and knew what I was talking about, but wasn't the case. And I assumed that people um, knew this and saw this, because in a way, it is the way everybody is enlightened, everything is enlightened. 
And then it was like I had to remember a human part of me to distinguish and to judge and to put up boundaries, which was really beautiful and really relevant. Because like I see people on Facebook and on the internet arguing about this subject and accusing people, there's been this big article about um, one teacher, accusing people of this and that. And, and it's like you, they all believe in the cult of reality. Like they're saying this is a cult or this is a cult or that is a cult, but they're all believing in a cult of reality. Like everything is a cult. Like, like it's like you slag off the spiritual teachers and you slag, slag off them for doing this. And I'm not promoting them or not promoting them. But look, look at our society. Everything is a cult. We're being influenced all the time. Like Facebook is suggesting ads to us. Our shops sell particular clothes the way our, our parents are, our society is. Like our society is one big cult. We're in many cults, at least with the guru. They're saying, I am a guru and I am enlightened. Whereas society is pretending it's not doing it and everything is trying to persuade you of something. And what I found with the guru is it's not that what the guru says is truth. It's what you believe is untrue. And that's the struggle um, with gurus, I think, is that they have to, in a way, put across an argument. They have to tell you what you're saying is not true, that that isn't true, that that is ego. But then it's not that something else is true. But in saying that, you begin to believe that's true. So then the mind gets into the cult of the guru, whereas the guru is saying not this, not that, not this, not that, not this, not that, not this, not that. And the, but the mind can't help but project a cult onto it. But everything is a cult. Like just even the way in which we're so used to the fruit and vegetables that we get promoted. Like um, I, uh, I used to have a boyfriend whose family was into fruiting. And I, I learned that most of the fruit and vegetables that we get in the West and that we choose and we have in our supermarkets aren't the best ones, but they look the best. So they look the most like a carrot. They look the most like a banana. And that's actually not the most tastiest fruit and vegetables. But because that's what we're used to and that's what we've been brainwashed by, we pick vegetables and fruit that aren't that tasty because it looks to our idea of it. So how much of a conditioning is that? How much of a cultism is that? And that's just one tiny thing, let alone our TV, our computers, the advertisement, our socializing, the branding. Everything is a cult, the, the Christmas cult. The Christmas cult, that's what I should have called this stream. Maybe I can change it. Let's see, <laughs> the Christmas cult. Like how much is a has how much is is Christmas a cult? I mean, who do you think promoted Christmas so much? Hmm. I think that's um, advertising companies that want to sell you the idea of presents, so then you buy more presents. I don't think it's a religious thing. I think it's about giving presents. Not that I'm against that. I love presents personally. I I really love getting given gifts. Now I'm not just saying that because I'm the guru and I'm like, <laughs> you're gonna send me gifts now. I do actually love receiving gifts, especially from my mum. My mum does really good presents. Um, so everything is a cult. And it's seeing that none of what we think in our mind is reality. It doesn't mean that the mind can't think and that we can't say this is red, this is computer, I like him, I don't like her. It's just that none of it's reality. What is reality is presence. But normally your mind is so addicted to you and being in time. Uh-oh. Okay, I just have to go and delete Skype on my phone, otherwise this is going to be a nightmare. One sec. So it stretches everything. So I like the way that you see me. This is stretched to, because it's, um, it's, um, fitting to the screen, you know, like the long angle screen. So actually 
like to do that in order they stretch things so you can see at the background slightly bent it's just the way it is i've fixed the light i've fixed the sound so now i'm moan about the stretching i'll soon get it perfect um so anyway i thought my phone would stretch less but it's stretching just as much so um so it's seeing that's not that's not true. So what is left when you see that everything you think and feel isn't true, that sensation isn't reality, that sensation, the feelings, what you think, space, time, distance isn't the way things are. So when you strip that back and you question that, what's left? This is a live presence. That's what's left. But I can't describe that to you. It's this light shining through that is everything and nothing. You think that you're looking, but that's just a thought. You see, non-duality isn't about something you know or you believe. It's not about dualistic thinking. It's something beyond that. So you think that you look out of your eyes, but who looks out of your eyes? You think that you sit on the seat, but who sits on the seat? You think that you hear a sound, but who hears the sound? And what begins to be seen when those, when those, the attachment to the personality stops is that the hearing and the heard, the seeing and the seen, the feeling and the felt are one and the same thing, that there is no separation. That what you look at and the looking are the same thing. The consciousness isn't something that actually resides inside the body and the I am isn't something or that sense of I that gets confusing because other teachers speak about it differently. I don't mean I am as in I am someone, but that sense of being, that sense of I, big I or amness, is actually not inside the body, it's everywhere. It is everything and it's still and it's in movement and you don't need to imagine this, this isn't about you getting it it's the way it is as a stop seeing a grasping to looking in time and so what i think these talks are about and i don't know how to be the guru or how to do the guru thing but maybe that's something that just happened but what these talks are about is resonating with what's being said it's not understanding it. it's not leaving this talk with a new religion i'm actually anti-religion it's not about that. It's not about having a new dogma or belief system that you can go and battle with people on Facebook or f people on YouTube. It's about a sense of aliveness. It's a beingness. And you can't say you're right and you know it better than someone else because this could be put a thousand ways. A thousand ways. And every teacher says that the way they say it is the right way, and I'm implying the way I say it is the right way. But it's impossible. This has no wars. This cannot war against someone else. How can this war against something else when everything is yourself? And when I'm speaking, just to be clear, I speak on the personal level and I speak on the absolute level, and I jump between the two. And so that might be a confusing. And I really encourage you not to put non-duality on the personal level, which is confusing because the person always wants to take things on the personal level. So the person wants to say, I don't exist. 
I'm not somebody. There's nobody here. And the person thinks that's them. But there's always going to be a character that appears and the character is an ego, is a person. The character is, I am Lisa and I have just been working on a writing piece this afternoon. I was also washing my car and I walked the dog. I spent some time with my parents. I did not wrap presents. That is something I should do. Although my personal character doesn't believe in that stuff, I do it for, for the family. So yeah, there used to be this thing in Australia that I liked where you wrapped things in scarves so you didn't wait, waste the paper. I haven't got scarves to wrap it in. That was a nice idea. Hi Lisa, did you follow a guru at all or what ways helped you get to the point you are today? Thanks Bernie. Yeah, I talked about it earlier so you can re-watch this video if you didn't um, watch it. Um, you know, it's not for a lot of people in the West because a lot of people in the West are so pro, they are right, that they, they feel like I can do it by myself online. And who knows? Maybe that's the way. The thing, the thing is, is it's got to be seen that everything you think and feel isn't true. That's the key to it. Or something beyond that. It's not getting rid or eradicating the character. It's the seeing that who's experiencing right now isn't the character. The character is experience. But the character is part of the experience. I used to think that it was a total eradication of the character or a death of the character. And it, it's, it's this death of this glue that sticks you to the character. It's not the death of the character or the personality. It's this, this glue and seeing that you're something beyond that. Something way beyond that. I think the character's got to be the character. There is also a feeling that I'm doing fine without a teacher. This is from Darren. After all, why do I need to go around the world to find a guru? I bumped into Muji last year in my local park. That was unexpected. I guess they just need to go to the park more often. Yeah, I can imagine that was <laughs> unexpected. Yeah. And really, life's your teacher. It's not really a person, it's life. And really when the guru is demanding the surrender of the student, it's life demanding the surrender. It's life you're surrendering to, not a person. It's often, or sometimes in some people's cases, it's a teacher that, um, that's uh, surrendered to first. The human is a surrender to first, and then there's a surrender to the rest. Lovely energy today, Lisa. Yeah, it's nice.
I think the source often of the seeking of the attachment to the person is this sense of guilt. You know the story of Adam and Eve being in the Garden of Eden. This guilt at their own nakedness. When they became self-aware, they realized they were naked. And I think that this is the source of the attachment to the person. is this sense that you own this life and you have to control things. You have to do this life. And so there's such a busy involvement in trying to do this life correctly that you're going to get it wrong, that you're going to fail. But thanks, guys. Merry Xmas. Enjoy the Christmas cult. <laughs> Sending you lots of love. Bye, guys.